What I would suggest is pull up your small business social media page on Instagram. And there's on the far right side, there's a little button where it says um, like content that you're tagged in. Mm -hmm. So I would say, go to that, go see the people that are already buying your content, using your stuff, using your products, posting about it on social, go into your stories and see who's tagging you. Like who are already your number one fans that love you and are already giving you love without you even asking about it. You may find some like people who are official influencers, as in like they do this real time mm -hmm. um, or for, you know, for their work. You may find people who do this on the side, but will be thrilled to partner with you because they'd love to lift up a small local business. All right. Welcome to the Push Forward podcast. I'm your host. This week, I have the pleasure of interviewing somebody who's doing something very different in the world of influencer and creator marketing. Um, I think most people know how it works. The fact that influencers and creators get paid to promote brands. Um, it's pretty transparent these days. And I think apps like uh, Shopify Collabs and other others out there, like even the SEM Rush in my world mm -hmm. of marketing, we use that to identify influencers but in your case joanna it's it's i was like really intrigued to understand what it is that you do and how you cultivate these different influencers that are from diverse backgrounds and then marry them with the right yeah. brand so without further ado i want our listeners to welcome you joanna voss to the podcast love it thank you for having me alex i am absolutely very excited i could wax poetic about all things talent management so Happy well, to well, chat. Yeah. Well, we're going to do that today. But before we do, well, we want to talk a little bit about your background because mm -hmm. I find I found it tr truly interesting that you worked in politics early I, on in your career. So I tell did. us about that experience. And I'm sure that led into being in the world of, you know, uh, marketing influencer and all that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my first job was out of college for eight years. I graduated in 2001. Uh, I worked on political campaigns. So I worked two presidential campaigns. I worked John Kerry's first or John Kerry's only presidential campaign. And then Hillary's first presidential campaign in 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. um, mostly worked in New Hampshire. So I worked on the getting the person elected side, not the policy. Like once they are elected, mm -hmm. I was always, you know, those people who was running around trying to get votes and volunteers and knocking on doors and making tons of phone calls and stuff. Um, loved it. And it's one of those things where, you know, I graduated college, I had a Spanish and environmental studies major, like who knew what I wanted to do? I got into campaigns because it was actually about environmental issues and like trying to save the trees and clean up the water and all that. Um, but now in hindsight with God, 20 plus years, um, you know, you just see like how the universe has led me to here. I, I mean, my, my, plan my my path would have never ever been plotted by anybody from campaigns and then I traveled the world uh backpack on the world for a year lived in Spain a couple times and like then started my entrepreneurial journey in January of 2011 never meant to be an entrepreneur but like what I do now part of why I'm, I think I'm really good at it is I had the skill set that was developed you know, you're knocking on doors, asking people for their votes and you're asking for money those are like two of the most personal things that you could ask for and so that, the resilience, the persistence, obviously you get way more no's than you get yeses. It just mm -hmm. really like trains you. And so I, I think now about like why I'm so good at what I do. I'm sure part of it I'd like to think was just my DNA and like I was kind of wired like that. But my career path, which seems very random to people who don't know me, uh, I totally feel like just led me to here. Um, but yeah, I love I love talking politics. I am totally that person who will like talk politics at dinner i'm happy to be like oh you disagree with me on this like <laughs> let's get into well, it I'm, we, I'm genuinely just curious yes yeah, so, so we we could do that all day by the way i volunteered for the uh john Kerry um uh during that election uh hillary yeah. barack all of those so i've been yeah. involved from like the, my time in college as well and i'm like you I am a nerd when it comes to politics. I love it. I listen to the podcast, to the shows, totally. Totally. and I, I like to hear all sides too. So all all good that. stuff. And and I I think you're right as far as like your path, Joanna, um, makes sense because I love to look at how the marketing campaigns are run 
and on, on the political sides, you know, and especially like in social media, like Barack in, you know, 2007, 2008, the way they were running their campaigns was like very unique, yes. you know, and, yeah. and it's changed each time around. Now we're dealing with AI and misinformation and all this other stuff. But um, see, we're, we're not going to get into politics because everybody wants to hear about influencer. And so I'm going to switch gears another, right back another to, touchy conversation we'll talk about influencer marketing <laughs> that, that's right yeah after the podcast maybe we'll spend some time talking about politics but i know our listeners who are mostly influencers marketers um people in that world you know creator world um i saw uh recently a a, a an article on Forbes that talked about this year being the year of AI. But then there was like another article was like, it's the year of the creator because this economy for creators is growing so fast. So give us like a 30,000 foot view of like where you see the world of inf influencer and creator marketing going. Yeah, uh, it's not going anywhere. And the reason why is because everyone has a smartphone. Everyone has the world in their hands. Like everyone has some version of a smartphone that has an amazing camera, which is another conversation, but they have like everyone's customers, every, pick a pick a brand, pick a destination, pick a product, pick a thing. Everyone has some customer of theirs or client or guest, however you want to call it, that is on a smartphone. So mm -hmm. not doing influencer marketing, not doing digital marketing, not figuring out a way to get your message to people on social media platforms, because regardless of whether it's right or wrong and what people think, people are on social platforms different generations, different ages are on different platforms. They consume it differently. They use it differently. But at the end of the day, that's where people are at. So if brands were to not do influencer marketing, I would say, well, then what would they do? Like, it's not like they're going to radio. People are not mm -hmm. on the radio. <laughs> you know, they're not going to <laughs> newspapers. That's, you know, that's not happening. So it's digital marketing is just, and of course, like there's more streaming platforms. We're forced to, have more streaming platforms, right? Like now you have to have Netflix and Hulu and Peacock and all of those. So I, I think our culture and our lifestyle continues to just push us in that direction. So influencer marketing is not going anywhere. Like that's just the way to get in front of people's customers. I, I so agree with you. And, you know, especially when talking to solopreneurs or small businesses who don't have the same budgets as, you know, the the brand side or the, the mm -hmm. big agencies to partner with the biggest influencers, but, but you've got those, all those different levels of influencers, right? Nano, micro, whatever. Um, there's such great opportunity there to really make it an organic connection between your product, your brand and that end user. And I do feel like there's an untapped economy there. So how do businesses, not the large companies, we know how they partner, they've, they've got right. people on their side, but like for a small business owner, um, and, and not on the influencer, right? I'm talking about the the, the small business themselves. Yeah, the brand side. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, the brand side. It's like how, like, I'm not going to go on a platform because I'll get lost. Like, that. I hear that all the time. Yep. Cost so, money, it's expensive. Exactly. Yep. So that's why for me, when I when Katie introduced us, I said, oh, gosh, you're like the perfect person to ask this question to because maybe there is an army of talent people like you out there who, instead of leaving it to a platform to find the person... It's someone like yourself who then identifies that 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 right influencer, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, shout out to Katie Stoller. We love Katie Stoller. Um, yes, and I actually, I don't think it's talent managers in this case. So for okay. any small businesses that are listening, um, because honestly, to, to reach out to us, to, you know, if a small business is new to this space and trying to figure it out, um, Yes, can talent managers help? And perhaps we work with smaller talent that may be a good fit. But if you're a smaller business, you might be more geographic specific. You might be more location specific. Um, you may have brick and mortar. So it may be like actually a physical location. You may not ship very far. You may not have online shipping. Maybe people can't purchase, you know, with an online store. So I don't know that going to talent management would make sense because you'd want a creator that's specific and local mm -hmm. using that example, like to your area. So what I would suggest is pull up your small business social media page on Instagram. And there's on the far right side, there's a little button where it says um, like content that you're tagged in. Mm -hmm. So I would say, go to that, go see the people that are already buying your content, using your stuff, using your products, posting about it on social, 
go into your stories and see who's tagging you. Like who are already your number one fans that love you and are already giving you love without you even asking about it. You may find some like people who are official influencers as in like they do this real time mm -hmm. um, or for, you know, for their work, you may find people who do this on the side, but will be thrilled to partner with you because they'd love to lift up a small local business. Um, so I would start there and really, really, really spend some time on just, I'm not talking about like a five second scroll, but I mean like literally sit and spend yes. some time who keeps popping up, who are the same people who post about you, you know, and have for the past six months and also post about your own stories Go to their page, see what they're about, um, you know, look to see their content. You can reach out and ask them for demographics on their local audience. Again, if you're like location specific so that you can, you don't want to partner with someone who's like all their people are in LA and you're in Atlanta, mm -hmm. you know, but I would start there with people that are already like your number one fans. It's such an easy lift. You know, maybe they'd be open for like store credit or a trade, or maybe they have right. like, a fun, creative way to post about you because they're creative and they see you in the community in a different way than you do. Mm -hmm. um, reach out to local, other local businesses. Like if you're in a downtown front, you know, maybe all of you collectively do something together to kind of like lift everybody up and capitalize on everyone else's social. So that's probably where I would start. There, um, it's, there's all those political really skills. There's all those political skills coming into play. They're coming into play now because it sounds to me like a grassroots effort, which I love. <laughs> I love, love, love. Now, in, for the influencer side, um, you know, a, a, a question that I often get is like, what what is the cost? And I'm not very familiar with the cost, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Where where do they start? What can they expect? Do they need to be of a certain size and, and have a, a media kit like... Like, how does that work? Yeah. Um, you're going to hate the answer. It depends. Yeah, yeah. No, that's what... <laughs> Um, There are content creators. So a couple different things to keep in mind. Not everyone who has a big following is an influencer. And not everyone who's an influencer has a big following. As you said earlier, there's all these different levels. And, you know, you're celebrity over a million. And there's mid-tier and nano and micro and mega. And I think there's some other ones I forgot. Yeah. Um, if you are, again, that going back to that small business, like I would look to someone who has a smaller following that is, again, more local. But if you are, you know, not geographic specific and let's say you have some budget to spend, um, you could work with someone who just, I'll say big following, 50,000 just to pick a number, 40,000. They may do this on the side. They may have a nine to five and just do this on the side. And uh, they're like, hey, 500 bucks would be great. And you're like, oh, that's amazing. Okay. And they do a reel and some stories for you. You may talk to someone else who has 35,000. They do this full time and they're like, oh, actually a reel and some stories is $1,500. So there is no standardization of X followers get you X amount. Um, you know, if someone isn't doing this full time and their, their livelihood is not dependent on this work, they may just do it because it's fun and they get a free meal or they get, right. you know. A free hotel today and that's totally fine uh and then there's other people who do this like my creators who do this full time so there's a livelihood they have teams they have staff they pay to help them you know create and produce the content and market everything so just go in with open eyes ask lots of questions of the influencer and just be super clear on like what your goals are because there are some people you know if you want to convert if you want online sales specifically around something ask for screenshots of their link clicks if someone is not good at converting and they're much more, they're matter, better about brand awareness, well, then you don't want to hire them to get, to sell a candle because they can tell, tell you about the candle. They can tell you why it's so great. They can style it. They can like make you feel like you can smell it. But sometimes, you know, their followers might not be so quick to purchase the way someone else has a follower audience where they're like, listen, I'm just going to give you discount codes. And I'm going to tell you like great deals and people go to them strictly to purchase. So there's kind of two different types of influencers. So just ask lots of questions and be super clear about what your campaign goals are. That makes sense. And for those influencers that are just getting started, they haven't made it their full-time mm -hmm. um, business yet. 
what what are like the top things that you would say to focus on habits? Like I I enjoyed one of the articles on your site that uh, said you know twelve habits of yep. influencers. I was like, wow, this is really yeah. interesting. You know, from a perspective from someone who actually judges and scores people on on these things so what are like the top things to really focus on in order to market yourself to brands and absolutely yeah so no particular order high quality content Mm. what does that mean what does that mean make your photos good nothing blurry like we all know we can look at photos and we're like what is happening here like this is a crappy photo right we all there's no excuse because we all again have that amazing smartphone with amazing cameras I know so many creators who don't even bring their fancy, you know, Canon XYZ 500 anymore because they're like, I actually just great get great content with my iPhone. Mm-hmm. So high quality photos, like sharp, clear images. Um, be be good at your craft. Be be someone who delivers value. Who who like why are people coming back to your page? You know what? Who are you serving? What's your audience? What's the value you provide? Is it because you give these great three-day itineraries that feels like luxury travel, but it's like totally affordable for someone who works a nine-to-five job or for families? Is your thing that you can DIY something in under $200 in like one day and make it less scary for people? Is it that you can put a healthy meal on the table and 15 minutes and you've got three kids that are under the age of five, you know, like why are people coming back? Like what's the value that you provide? So be super, super clear on that. I have people reach out to me all the time and they're like, I just want to be an influencer. And I'm like, it's it's like pictures of your cat is like random stuff. Like what, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? Um, So figure that out. Sometimes it helps to ask other people because they may know you better and may know like, Oh, you're always helpful on X. Um, Plan it out. Be married to it. If you want to do this full time as a creator, this is not a joke. This is not something to just like, oh, I'll get to it when I get to it and kind of like, oh, it's there. I'll just like take some pictures and like post about it and the brand will pay me. No, no, no. The people who are earning money and doing this work their butts off. They are committed. They are resilient and they are relentless and they are constant, even showing up when it seems like no one's listening. You know, oh, my reel only got 100 views. Like everyone starts at zero. We all, it's very humbling. Everyone starts there, but it's really hard, you know, and you are starting now and you see people that you love that have viral content and thousands of views and all these followers. It's hard to keep going when you feel like, why am I doing this? Like no one's listening, but that is when people start to drop off. So that's when like, if you can just kind of keep going and know that it's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done, but just like, it's not rocket science. Rinse, lather, repeat, create that content, post about it, be creative, do it again. Just like keep showing up and keep showing up. That will get you traction and your content's your portfolio. So that's how you attract, you know, the brand's attention and their eyes and stuff. So just continue to like always come back to high value quality content. Yeah. And I, and I think it makes sense. I mean, whether we're talking business politics or, you know, sports or music we have on our, um, uh, influencer app push bio, we have a lot of musicians, you know, and my son happens to want to be a musician. He's oh, cool. yeah, he's going to turn 14 and he raps and he's really good at it. Um, That's... but like what I explained to him, it's the same thing as business, right? In that, you know, uh, yes, your plan is to go big. Most people want to grow continuously. And, and, and even if you do all the right things, you, you just may not get there because to me, it's always, you know, an, uh, art science slash luck thing. Yeah. Um, magic. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's magic. And, and so if it doesn't happen, that's, that's okay. You know, I, I have a, another guest here on this podcast who she's come on here regularly. She has the happy family blog. Oh, cool. She's like a mommy blogger, her and her husband, they do travel, stuff like that, work with Disney. Uh, she She's amazing, Christy. And she talks about that in that, you know, they've had like, they've, they've spun out different channels for, the re- for, for that reason, right? Because maybe this one got to here and it's almost like a line of business, right? And you yeah. did it really well, but now you're ready to do something different yes. or 
or that will allow you to actually grow bigger. So you were talking like food, you know, travel. Those are categories that are very competitive, um, but but also in high demand. So for those types of influencers that we see on on our app, um, you know, travel and food, musicians, what what are some of the biggest trends that you're seeing in terms of like what are user what do users want? Are they mostly on oh. TikTok, Instagram? Oh, um, platform wise, it depends on the generation. It really does just depend on the audience. Okay. Uh, like obviously Gen Zers. No, not Gen Zers. Yeah. Gen Zers. Like they're like Facebook. What? Like even millennials are like Facebook. What? Like I'm 45 and I remember I was long out of college, but I remember when it was, you had to have a college address, you know, dot edu and, yes. uh, that was the platform. And so now apparently Gen Zers and I think even some millennials are like, oh, Facebook, like, why would I even? Um, I think TikTok's, you know, y'all kind of have this understanding that TikTok is for maybe younger millennials and Gen Zers. Mm -hmm. um, boomers are on different platforms. Boomers are reading blogs, reading newsletters. Um, I think trend wise, what I'm seeing, I think both from the consumer side, so the people that are just like doing the scrolling and then mm -hmm. also from the brand side, is people want it personal. Okay. Great. You have a pretty house. How'd you put it together? Like, how did you do it? You know, how, what's your story? Like, why'd you pick that sofa? Why'd you put that flower vase there? Why did you make this recipe? Like, what's, what's the relevance of it? And people like seeing like the face behind it, right? We do want to feel that human connection, even though it is across the small little mini screen, people want to know the face behind the brand. And if you look at a lot of big brands like magnolia for example it's chip and joanna's face all over the whole thing like we all know you say magnolia what do you think of you think of those two people like the games family um and i think on the creator side also pushing people towards that because as you said before there's so much competition there's so many new creators there's so many more tools that brands have to find creators it used to be even six years ago seven years ago um, maybe like 2015, 16, 17, even then it was like a brand would reach out, Hey, a thousand dollars. Like, can you do a recipe? Sure. Okay, great. We'll send you the product. And then the blog post goes live. There's no approval. There's no concept approval. I mean, we've all of these things where you're not sending metrics, you're not sending insights. So there's a lot more tools. The brands have to find creators. They can put in Mexican foodie. They'll have so many people pop up. So how do you stand out? It's your story. You're the only one who has your story. You're the only one who has your perspective. You're the only one who looks like you, talks like you, creates the way you do. You know, you can have one recipe done by six different people, completely different. And so pushing creators to get in front of the camera and incorporate more of that personal is what will help them stand out because brand that's how brands are catching people's brands are brands are it's catching the eye of brands. And then consumers are also loving it. So it helps your engagement, it helps your views. So I feel like that's just pushing people to be more personal is beneficial to everybody. In in terms of negotiating with the brands uh, and, and, you know, I kind of picked up on this, when you said it was your superpower, but it, you clearly did a good job on your site. Um, Thank you. you know, kind of painting that picture that, that that's one of the main value propositions that you give to anybody who comes your way. I think that's really a, a good one because most people have a very hard time selling themselves and negotiating. So talk to us about, yeah. you know, how you do that and, and why do influencers, are they just like everybody else that it's kind of hard to negotiate? Yeah. I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. You can already tell I'm like getting ready. I love talking about negotiation. Um, it's hard to sell yourself. Everybody knows this, right? This is this is no different to influencers, to artists, to musicians, yeah, to authors, like even not not, people, not for me and you. <laughs> right. I'm like, I'm like, what do you want? I got it. Like, I'll sell you something. Um, I mean, I'm constantly negotiating. I'm, I, I'm with you. I love it. Yeah, I two of my two of my stories I always talk about when people are not yet ready or not looking to have a manager, it doesn't make sense, but obviously need to get better at it. It's a muscle. You have to just flex this muscle. Like the only way you're going to get better at it, super cliche, is to actually do it. Like there's no other quick workaround. I've been doing this for decades. And, you know, do I get nervous about stuff? Not really. Like it's very rare. But every once in a while, I'm like, oh, 
okay, you know, if it's like a client really, really wants it, or I don't know, sometimes maybe I'm just, they're, they're really, they're pushing back a lot and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I really got to like dig in and like use my magic, but it's, you just got to practice it. And, um, you know, often when I go out, I haven't done this lately, but you know, you got friends in town, or you're just out with like a you know, girlfriend or something. I'm, you're at the bar. I'm, I'm always like, Hey, my friend's in town. Like she's got a new job or I just had this great work win today. Or it's my birthday. Like, can we have a free round of drinks or can we have free apps? Like <laughs> I'm constantly asking for stuff. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. Um, it's definitely worked more than it hasn't mm -hmm. because it's just a matter of asking. And it's honestly just like a way to practice. So you can say, Oh, okay. Well, I didn't get, I didn't get that free drink, but they brought us like a free ice cream on the house at the end of the night, right? Like it's something. So then when you go into those negotiations and you're asking for money and it's about you, you've said that stuff aloud. Like it's not totally new. You may not have perfected the approach yet. You know, your muscle may still be growing, but it's just a matter of like asking and practicing. Um, so having a manager is great because obviously, you know, I don't take it personally if, a, if I say to a brand, okay, this the scope of work that you suggested for my client, Evat, is $15,000. And they're like, ooh, we only have eight. The creator might get super like, no, it's 15,000. Like they take it personally, you know? I'm like, no, 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 no. They're not saying you're not worth that. They're just saying that's not the budget they have allocated for this yeah. project. Two separate things. But obviously it's very personal. So a manager can be like, okay, cool, $8,000. Well, can we meet in the middle? Can we change the scope? Let's let's re look at the deliverables. How about the exclusivity? That was kind of big. Like that's a big price point. Like let's see, you know, if we can take that off. So it's just much easier for us to do that because obviously, like it's not personal. And remembering that it's just a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's just a back and forth. You know, I feel like I often talk to influencers who are like, "Hey, this is what the brand, you know, emailed me. Like, what do I say?" And I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. Like, they didn't talk about usage. They didn't talk about exclusivity. This isn't super clear. Like, why don't you ask them those questions? Because you can't give a rate without knowing the full project. And just reminding people that it is just that, oh, cool. Okay, actually, that's really interesting. So can you tell me a little bit more about the campaign or like what your expectations are? Mm -hmm. or what are you hoping to have happen with this? Because again, if they're looking to have you convert and sell XYZ products and that's not your strengths, don't do it. You know, you're not aligning on the campaign goals or vice versa. If you're like, actually, I am the perfect person to sell you this new skincare. Here's why I did one last week. So it's just, it's just that conversation of back and forth. Um, but yeah, I, I love negotiation. It's, it's, um, I think being super curious is very helpful. It helps kind of take away any nerves when you ask those questions because it kind of buys you some time. It gets you more information and it takes that pressure off of like, I have to say the right number so they don't run away and never come back again, which doesn't really happen, but. And and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not really standardized, right? All around the world and different verticals. And it, I see it, I go to Brazil, you see it in Europe, you see it all over. Um, the rates are all different. The guidelines yeah. are all over the place. I, I think we are all in this marketing world. It's still like in its infancy. And now, of course, you add AI to it. I just heard today, actually heard yesterday, um, um, global something something at Facebook, some some crazy title that meant nothing. But the, the, the gentleman was on PBS talking about how this is how we're going to combat AI, which was a bunch of bullshit because... Basically, they said, well, you know, all the fake, uh, deep fakes that we see uh, that are bad for, obviously, voters, okay, um, if if you created it using Llama or, like, Facebook's AI, uh, we'll be able to, you know, like, tackle it. But if you created it on another platform and brought it in, whether it's audio, video, pictures, yeah. we're, we're just going to be like, sorry, we're going to keep it up there. So. And I'm mentioning Facebook for obviously the obvious reason, right? Yeah. They're the, the biggest one, uh, biggest platform, and then followed by Google with YouTube and whatnot. So, you know, in, in terms of like standardizing, um, like, is are do you have any tips uh, for figuring out how you can standard standardize your approach, or are there brands that already come to you with that and say like, here's the mm. scope of work? How does that work? 
Yeah, it works both ways. Um, oftentimes a brand will come and say, hey, here's what we got, here's what we're looking for. Or more often than not, they'll probably say, hey, here's our scope and here's what we're looking for. Like, what's your rate to see if it aligns? Um, it could also be that perhaps they have a big pot of money, but it has to be divided between 20 people. And they're mm -hmm. kind of not, it's not necessarily like, oh, we have $20,000, everyone gets $1,000 because maybe someone's bigger, so mm -hmm. their rates are higher, someone's lower in price, so obviously that's lower. Maybe someone is just like, hey, I got low numbers comparatively to the rest of the group, but like I crushed the engagement, so they get more. So it's kind of hard to say, they don't often say your budget up front, but I do say to every creator, absolutely have, and I do this for my creators, have an a la carte list of every single deliverable that you could do okay, and just have your price. Like your reel, a carousel, stories, YouTube, Facebook, like every single thing, including paid usage, what it would be for 30 days. Be clear on what your exclusivity is included in that. Are you offering seven days, 14 days, 30 days? It wouldn't go past 30 days, um, meaning your time that you wouldn't work with a competitor. But, but just have it on a Google Doc. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when a brand will reach out and say, hey, what's your rate for this? Creators will all be like, oh, well, what's your budget? They ask all these questions, which I'm, I'm all about questions. But sometimes you're doing yourself a disservice because it could be someone who's just been tasked to go get rates to then take back to the table for them all to sit there and do the jigsaw budget puzzle of like, okay, we have X amount of money. Okay, we want these creators. Okay, these are priority. Okay, let's allocate X amount. So if you're not able to send your rates over in just a basic email without knowing all the other bits of information, you could be left out because they'll be like, oh, well, what about Alex? They're like, oh, well, Alex didn't get back to me. Alex had too many questions. Uh, okay, and Alex is out. Right. So it is a balance of like asking questions. And then also sometimes, you know, if a brand will reach out and just say, hey, we're uh, sourcing talent for a campaign, just looking on rates. I have one of these in my inbox right now. I have no idea what the project is. I don't know the budget. I don't know the timing. I know nothing about it. But I'm just going to reply with rates because I want my client to be considered right. for this project. And then down the road, when we learn more about the project, it's like, okay, then we can get into a bit more of the negotiation around usage and exclusivity and just like get more in the weeds. Yeah. And it's kind of like, even in the marketing world, you know, agency world where you sometimes a brand is like, I worked with Ford for a long time and with Ford, while it was like a nice brand to have under my umbrella early on, I also started my agency in 2011. So around the same time as oh, yours. Cool. Yeah. And I remember like, that was one of my first big clients and I had all these great ideas, right? So we go up there, we're pitching to them. They're like, time out. Like, you know, I'm like reading the room. You guys are just like one of many agencies. Like, we don't need to know all this. We just need to know like the bottom line is, can you push traffic, affiliate traffic to generate leads for the dealers? Yes. Like, we don't need ideas. Like we've got yeah. ideas. We've been selling cars forever. And it was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I thought you wanted my ideas. Like, right. no, we don't want your ideas. Just if you're going to be reliable, the, the cost, the value proposition, you could add tracking, like all the, you know, logistical stuff. And and I had to pick up on that quickly and and switch gears and tell my team, like, forget the presentation. Like, yeah. if, if we ask too many questions to your point, Joanna, it's like, now they're going to be like, well, this guy's a pain in the butt, doesn't know what he's doing, um, doesn't understand that our pain point is we need more leads, not freaking ideas. Right. Okay, I, you know, you, you go backwards and switch gears. So yeah. I think that that's, that's a very... Um, good uh advice that you're giving there all right so let's let's i want to finish off today with uh, the trends of ai because you know okay. it's on everybody's mind yeah like, overall what's your what's your take on it like as far as like the clients that you're working with how are they approaching ai we are using it as thought starters and to help with um kind of sometimes just getting the ball rolling a little bit of getting over writer's block Mm -hmm. You are sitting, staring at a blank piece of paper and you're like, I have to write this concept with many details and steps that I don't quite know yet. Maybe I'm not quite familiar. Um, or I have to write this caption for this reel and I am just out of creativity juice. Like, I got nothing. Uh, the talent I know and the influencers that I know, both the ones I work with and just other conversations that I have, it's like, okay, hey, I, give me give me some thought starters. No one's using it copying and pasting and saying, okay, right. here's our Instagram caption. But 
I mean, I, I have this all the time. Um, okay. I need to write a blog post about X, Y, Z. Like what are five questions people want to know about it, mm -hmm. about negotiation, whatever. And it'll write. And then I'm like, yep. Okay. Take it. And I'm off to the races and like write this whole blog post. So most of the creators I know use it in that capacity. It's to help them be more efficient with their time. Um, to help leverage what they're already doing across other platforms. A creator, one of my um, talent the other day was just telling me that she, uh, so she interviews people. So she has her interviews on YouTube and she can, and it's transcribed. So she can pull the transcription, put it in a chat GPT, and then write a blog post about it. Mm -hmm. Instead of her having to just do all yeah. of this labor. She's like, I've already done it. It's already over here. How do I kind of refinagle it and get it over here? And so chat, I think it was chat GPT helped her with that. And so she was like, oh my God, this is genius. Cause now I can create all this other content and leverage what I've already done over here. So we, yeah, we're big fans. I mean, it's, so what I was saying before is like, it will never replicate the personal voice. Right. So again, like we're not copying and pasting, do not copy and paste AI and, you know, put it in a blog post or a caption. Like it's kind of obvious that it's AI a lot of times, but you know, take it. Oh, I love this sentence. Like I'll often be like, Oh, I love this intro. This is a great way to start the paragraph. Or like, this is a solid sentence. Like let me build around it. So that's how we use it. I love it. I love it. That's really good advice. Yeah. We're big on AI too, but that's why I ask is it's just uh, that that's all we see in the news, you know? Um, all right. Well, so if anybody's interested in, in talking to you, whether mm -hmm. it's on the brand side or the, the influencer side, and they're, wondering like, how do I get to the next level? I gotta yep. go, gotta go talk to Joanna. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, probably three ways, depending on where you hang out. My website, joannaboss.com okay. has a wealth of information. My Instagram, feel free to slide into my DMs and chat me up there. And then I'm also pretty, I'm pretty big on LinkedIn. So uh, love hanging out over there. And those are, that's a great place to have conversations with other brands and agencies. So I love all three of those platforms. Awesome. And, and for the rest of 2024, what's like the big thing you're, you're not only just looking forward to, but uh, what was there like a big goal that you had personally this year you want to share with the listeners? Yes. So well, lots of goals, always lots of goals around here. <laughs> uh, personally related to business, I am just going to keep building out my website. I'm looking to monetize my site um, and just continue to be like sort of the hub on the internet around all things influencer talent management and influencer negotiation. So just working to build up my um, content library for that to happen. So a lot of, lot of typing for me in my future. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again for being in the podcast, Joanna. Thank you, Alex. This is great.